the CEO, she or he is self-listening. They're listening to themselves, have responses while the other person is talking. But let's say that lawyer or the CEO comes home from work, their spouse is talking, and you're listening for a few seconds, um, picking up the gist of what they're saying, and then beginning to form in your own mind's eye your response to that or your solution to that. And so the qualities it takes to be successful at work are so frequently in tension with the qualities it takes to be successful in love. Dr. Farrell, it is so good to see you again. We really haven't talked a whole lot since our last conversation, but I think about you and your work, especially with the boy crisis, uh, quite often, actually, especially with my co-host, Kip Sorensen. I, I mentioned him to you. Uh, we, we just cited your work, actually, I think just a couple of weeks ago on one of our podcasts, and I love that book. I know he does, too, and I'm excited to talk with you about your, uh, your latest book. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I'm really glad that the um, boy crisis uh, was Im impactful in your life. And I know that you, last time we talked, I think it was a couple of years ago, uh, you had said that, you know, you'd use it, um, you know, with your sons and your daughter. And, and so I was very pleased with that. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a great book. And it's interesting to me that it just becomes your work and my work just become more and more relevant over time. Have you noticed mm -hmm. that? It's, it just seems yeah. like there's more alienation against men, more, mm -hmm. uh, more hostility maybe even towards masculinity and manliness. Is that something, is that a trend that you notice as well or would you describe it differently? Yes, I, th I think the good news is that there, uh, so the, the circumstances for men are getting overall worse and worse, um, you know, to a greater degree than ever before. Uh, fewer men are graduating from, from college compared to women. And this is not, you know, these men's issues are not just men's issues because, you know, when women are in college, they don't want to have half, you know, twice the number of women as men uh, because that, you know, gives the odds of them, you know, they have to compete with a lot of other women if they're, women if they're heterosexual for a man. And so, and also, you know, when a woman graduates from college and a man doesn't, um, uh, and, the, and the numbers are, are getting closer and closer to two to one, which is projected to be in, the, uh, in about 10 years, uh, those women um, don't, you know, most college graduates who are women are not that interested in um, marrying men who are college dropouts or who haven't even gone to college. And so, you know, women have an inclination, you know, when, you know, they'll date a man and have sex with a man who's tall, good looking, um, but and unemployed. But if he's tall, good looking and unemployed, that's this. It ends with the sex. It doesn't. It, it does, she doesn't look to him um, for uh, f to be a future uh, husband. And so mm -hmm. that's, you know, if men and women aren't progressing at, at about the same rate, uh, there's a lot of uh, angst. Uh, that is created, and so that's um, it's not good for either sex. And you know, the you know men still committing suicide um, uh, is four times as often as women are, and you know being much more likely to die from drug overdoses and be addicted to video games and be addicted to porn. Uh, these are all things that are continuing. Uh, what is a little bit changed in a positive way is that there's been more recognition of boys and men's issues in the last uh, year or two uh, than there was uh, previously. And so that's beginning, so it's beginning to sort of become so bad uh, that even, you know, deniers have to, <laughs> have to sort of like, you know, realize that maybe we are, uh, maybe we need to pay more attention to boys and men's issues. It's interesting when I started doing this work in 2015, I received a lot of mockery uh, based on guys don't need this, there's no issue with men, there's no war on masculinity, there's no, there's, there's none of this. And in 2024, uh, I think I receive significantly less scorn, mock, and ridicule about the work mm. that we're doing. In fact, if anything, I, I am continually receiving positive and encouraging messages because mm. there is clearly, I don't want to say a war against manliness and masculinity, at a minimum, there's a dismissal of it. And I think it's something that needs to be addressed. You did mm -hmm. say something interesting, though, about marriage. And, and I wrote this down as you were saying this. Tell me if you think I'm right. And I, I wrote this down on a whim. So tell me if you think I'm right. Women marry potential is what I wrote. Women marry mm -hmm. potential and men marry beauty and fertility. Agree or disagree? 
Basically agree, um, especially the beauty part. Um, the fertility, many men don't, many men are okay about having children, okay about not having children. Some men, of course, are very desirous of having children. Um, and if that's a strong thing for men, then fertility is, is, is an issue. Um, but, um, and men, but if a woman wants a child and a man does not really want a child, but he's not sort of like super firm about it, uh, they'll have a child. Um, and uh, that will that will almost you know nine out of ten times I would say that that will happen, um, but it, it's definitely true that men are interested in youth and beauty and addicted to it, and uh, women are interested in um, in uh, economic security, and are addicted to it even when they earn their own uh, source of money. Um, it's still very unlikely that a woman will earn a man that is, let's say, really a, a wonderful. Um, not a provider protector, but a nurturer connector. Um, uh, women often will say to me things like, you know, oh, oh, it's so unfair. Men can be have it all men, but women can't be have it all women. And I say, actually, that's not accurate. Um, a woman can be a ha have it all woman. Well, how? And I go, well, by um, she she can um, focus on her career and go go as high as she wishes to go, and have children if she marries a man who is more of a nurturer connector man and would be happy to stay home and be with the children. But there's one condition that you need to respect him because if he's home with the children full time and he doesn't feel your respect for that, um, then he will, that he'll, he'll sense that. And every man knows on some level, men don't usually articulate this, but they know on some level uh, that if a woman, that a woman can't love a man, she doesn't respect. And if he begins to go to a party and see that she's sort of like uh, flirting with some of the, um, the, the, you know, the top people in her company or whatever, um, he'll set, sense that and pick that up in the same way that you would pick it up if if he if you were pregnant and you said, "Gee, do I look good good to you?" And he said, "Oh, sweetie, you look just perfect to me." And then he goes to a f party and flirts with other, um, you know, quasi anorexic women who don't have the tummy. And so, <laughs> you know, we're, we're we're all sensitive to to the way we're rejected. And um, but you know, the big thing is understanding that if only one sex wins, both sexes lose. Uh, we're mm -hmm. all in the same family boat. And it's um, and, and during the last half century, um, we've paid attention to women's issues, and we've said that uh, men's issues are well. You know, uh, we we need to provide resources for for men because they have all the power, they have all the privilege, and uh, not men. We need to provide resources for women because men have had all the power and all the privilege, and so uh, we don't want to um, you know do things for men because. Men already have the power and they have a privilege. And, and that's a complete misunderstanding of, um, of, of men and masculinity. So just to make it clear how that is a complete misunderstanding. Um, when I started, I've started hundreds of men's groups. I used to be on the board of directors of the National Organization for Women, as you know, and I was, I guess, the world's leading male feminist, if you will, and spoke all around the world on women's issues and, um, and the importance of them. And the um, as I as I did that, um, I um, the National Organization for Women was about to uh, get rid of men, and they had a, a big debate about whether they should get rid of men or not, and not, not allowing them to join now. Um, and so they finally decided that you know well, uh, we'll um, the big problem was that once a month they had consciousness raising groups. And the consciousness raising groups, when men got involved with them, the women were inhibited about saying what they really felt for, for very obvious reasons. And so they said, um, and, uh, you know, basically the question was, how can we get the men out of women's hair? And um, <laughs> their solution was to ask, uh, say, say, well, let's ask Warren Farrell if he would be willing to um, uh, form some men's groups. Um, at the time that the um, women's groups are meeting so that he can get the men, you know, in, in their own separate groups. And I did that. And for a, a number of uh, months, I sort of, um, since my, I was doing my doctoral dissertation on the women's movement, you know, I would, um, and all these pe men attending the now meetings, they were all male feminists. And so we would, you know, we would all compete to be the, you know, the biggest jock in the sensitivity group. And the, um, and so, um, but one day I decided instead of like lecturing to the men about the importance of feminism, to, I just decided to listen to their life stories. And I asked them uh, the question, what's the biggest hole in your heart? 
And uh, we went around and uh, for many of the men, and then as I formed some 300 men's groups and I found this to be repeated again and again, uh, the biggest hole in their heart was doing something like they wanted to be, a, they were an elementary school teacher or an artist, a writer, an actor, a musician. Um, so they, they were doing something that was very fulfilling to them. Uh, but then they had their first child and they realized that that fulfilling job with a couple of exceptions did not pay enough to support themselves, their children, to buy a new home uh, that would accommodate uh, a larger family in a good school district that would allow their children to have opportunities that they didn't have and allow their wives, wives and them to have a decent home in a decent neighborhood with decent schools. And so in order to do that, I remember one man, he, he, just, he, was a, he was just a sweetheart of a guy and he loved kids and by all reports, he just got along with them so well and it was his passion uh, to be involved with them. And, but he realized that you know, the teachers did not make enough money um, to be able to do those you know, aspirations that I was just mentioning. So he, he, to his great regret, gave up teaching. He was the type of person who hated administrative stuff and you know, um, you know, petty little squabbles between you know, different parts of the young community. Um, but he did it because he felt that he needed to earn more money and work uh, longer and harder hours in order to, be, uh, to, to support his family. And then, um, and, and a number of men gave up uh, musician um, gigs, especially um, because that wasn't earning enough money to support four or five people. And so, um, but then they heard the feminist community saying, well, um, look at education. Uh, only a small number of um, men compared to women are teachers. And, um, and yet uh, the majority of the principals and the superintendents of schools are men which goes to show you two things, that men have men, male privilege and men have male power. And I began to see, wow, these men gave up their passion to do what they needed to do rather than what they wanted to do, not because of male privilege and male power, but because of male obligation and male responsibility. And mm -hmm. we were, and, and rather than being appreciated for it, uh, these men were being put down as, as you know, you're the principals and superintendents because you have all the power and all the privilege. And I began to see that men were being misunderstood in a very fundamental type of way. And if there was a hashtag men too, as opposed to a hashtag me too only for women, that men would be encouraged to talk about these things and share what their feelings and fears were. But for the most part, um, you know, women and particularly women who are feminist in their orientation, uh, don't um, understand this about men. They see men as having male privilege and male power. That's really interesting. I mean, I, I wrote so much down here as you were talking about this. <clears throat> power is really interesting. I think power is in the eye of the beholder, really, or the, the person who is subject to that power. So, for example, a, a woman might believe that a man has power if he's an administrator versus an educator. Mm -hmm. Actually, in the classroom is what I mean by that. Yes. And men generally might think that women hold the power because they hold the breeding rights. <laughs> They're the ones who get to decide who is going to breed and who is not. And I know that strips it down to its like most basic fundamental level, but there's a lot of men. You look at the MGTOW movement, you look at the red pill movement, you look at uh, the incel movement, and there's a lot of men who believe that women hold all the power because they're the ones who get, get to select their, their, uh, their mates. And so it's interesting when you're talking about power, it's really subjective. Power is not objective. It's subjective based on what your goals and desires are. Well, yes, let's see. It's sort of, there are different dimensions of this. So clearly the president of the United States has more power over more people um, than, than um, you and I have, right? Or, or then, sure. and you and I have actually, you know, more influence than, than most people have. Um, but the, um, and so there is that type of power. But I define power as having control over one's life. And the way power has typically been defined um, for men as, is as feeling obligated to earn money that often someone else spends while they die sooner. And, you know, if I were to go and do a, an all women's workshop and say, I'm going to teach you to have power, I'm going to teach you to, have, uh, to feel obligated to earn money 
that someone else will spend while you die sooner. <laughs> the women Can would I laugh. jump you in there it? on that one real quick? Yes, sure. I, what I'm hearing you say, and I want you to correct me if, if I'm wrong, is that men perceive themselves as expendable, and men, so do yeah. women. That's what I'm hearing you say. Well, yes, let's see. Men and the, the, the that is that is the that is the, the reality. However, the perceive themselves is a little bit. Um, men don't think of themselves as disposable. The the subtitle of of the book, The Myth of Male Power, that I wrote, is why men are the disposable sex, um, and I explain that men were disposable in war and disposable in the workplace, meaning that 93% of the deaths at work are, in the, um, are for, um, by men um, and a higher percentage of the injuries and the remnant injuries are almost all men. By remnant injuries, I mean um, a firefighter um, is far more likely to die at work if he's a male. Um, and uh, yet the remnant injuries after he retires, him dying from black lung disease as a result of being a firefighter are almost completely um, by, by men. And so men don't even look at that. They just accept that. That's them. Um, and women don't look at the fact that these, that, that, you know, that men are disposable. They just, that's so much a part of our, you know, inner being. Um, you know, we, um, whenever, whenever there, each generation has had its war. And as each generation has had its war, um, men have been asked to um, to be willing to risk being killed and also to kill. And we know that it's traumatizing. Well, it's obviously traumatizing to be killed, but it's um, and it's also traumatizing to kill. Um, and you know, the PTSD is almost always a result of you know seeing a very close friend be killed, um, or alternatively um, having seeing somebody that you have killed. And uh, or some type of trauma like that, and so the um, and so men um, just accept the fact that you know you know Uncle Joe joined the Marines. His picture is on the on the on the mantle. He's our hero, and so we use words like hero and respect for men. They're social bribes for men to do um, to be willing to be disposable in each generation's war. Um, however, there's a new sort of crisis that's happened since in the, in the last 20, 30, 40 years, which is that it used to be um, men would define it as their purpose to join the war and be disposable or you know, join a, a profession that earns a lot of money um, or um, leaves them disposable at work or they, you know, they climb some economic ladder and they, and they barely have a life. Um, but and they're disposable in, in a different type of way. They're disposable as human beings, um, and they change human beings in for being human doings. Uh, they climb to the high, height, height of some ladder um, with and lose lose touch with who they are. And so these are things that um, that men don't even think about. They just do. And women don't think about men being disposable either. They just um, are much more willing to marry. Um, somebody who um, earns a lot of money um, or is going to, going to be and maybe is a lawyer or a doctor without regard to um, how many hours per week um, he, um, he works and, um, and you know, that, that type of thing. And so um, I think that there's a, there's a, there is a difference between having what I would call power or not having it and even the, the trap for many men is they've never thought about that. They've just been human doings, not human beings. What's interesting about a, a woman who, and I'm speaking, speaking in generalities, but a woman who would marry for potential, if that's the term we're going to use, a doctor, mm -hmm. a lawyer, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, that's what she maybe even subconsciously is marrying for, but you get 10, 15, 20 years into a marriage and Lo and behold, a woman gets exactly what she wants. She's got a doctor. She's got a, a, an attorney. She's all the money is coming into the family, and then all of a sudden, it's like, well, you're not here for the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that a lot of guys and gals run into: is that a woman marries for that potential. The guy achieves the potential he was sought after for, and then he's ostracized or divorced or separated from the family. Because he's pursuing the thing that she actually wanted. Yes. And then that brings us back to the have-it-all woman, the woman complaining that she's, you know, she can't, she can't be a have-it-all woman, whereas men can be have-it-all men. 
And so what I say to women about that is that you can be a have it all woman. You can, um, if you seek out a man who's basically a nurturer connector and you show him and, and you let him know that this is what you would love, then he, then men like that who raise children, the children do extremely well on average. Um, and the, and, and the father is happy if he feels respected and not happy if he doesn't. Um, but if she, if she runs that one condition by herself, that could I respect a man who is taking care of the children full time, maybe doing something on the side to earn money, but I'd still respect him whether or not that does produce money. Um, and then, um, uh, and then I can have, be a have it all woman. That is, I can go, I can break a glass ceiling, um, but I, I will, um, but I will be able to have children that I know are home being raised well and a man that is happy with doing that. Now, many women say to me, well, would a man be willing to do that? Um, and first of all, she has to usually grapple with whether she'd be comfortable with a man doing that. <laughs> and then, and she has to be she, honest about it because uh, yes, on and, the surface, it, she'll say that she definitely will say that, yeah. but deep down, she may not actually feel or act in accordance with that thing she just said. Yes, that's, that's often the case. And some women are pretty conscious of the fact that they, well, I don't think I really would be comfortable marrying a man who is staying, is staying home full time. He's not earning any money is usually what I'll hear from him. And I'll say, well, let's just say that that's the case. Or he may have a desire to earn money, but not really end up producing it in, in reality. Um, and so would you not have respect for him? And uh, many women have to grapple with that. But if she does grapple with that and does handle that, um, then she has she becomes a have it all woman. Uh, she has her you know, career. She has her children well raised. And what's one, what's wonderful about women that is not true for many many uh, all all successful men is that successful women do tend to sort of like if their children are having their birthday or a special recital, uh, they tend they will tend even if they're in CEO type positions to make sure that they clear out the space to, to attend that recital, to attend those special occasions. Um, men, most, many men will, increasingly men will do that today, uh, but many men sort of feel Not that their first ob the first obligation is to make sure that they, you know, they fly to D.C., uh, even though they live in Utah, and you know, make sure that they get that account, because if they don't get that account, they won't get the next account after that. And, like, they see the ripple effect of, um, of not getting everything um, there. And so, but in the process, both men and women run into um, the success love gap. What I mean is that the qualities it takes to be successful at work are in tension with, T-E-N-S-I-O-N, in tension with the qualities it takes to be successful in love. And here's what I mean by that. The, in order to be successful at work, let's say you want to be a great lawyer. Um, when, the, uh, when the opposing lawyer is speaking, your job is to formulate in your own mind's eye responses that you can give that lawyer to that lawyer's argument while that lawyer is speaking. Or, yeah, you're being or, confrontational by design. By design, exactly. Um, and, the, um, and, and if you don't find anything that you can confront well, to distort something he said or she said um, so that you can argue with the distorted version of that. So you're, you're, what you're doing is self-listening. If you don't do that, you haven't done well by your client. And, and if, you, if you say to the person speaking, uh, the opposing lawyer, let me see if I'm completely understanding what you're saying. And what I'm hearing you say is this. Is that accurate? Did I distort anything? <laughs> Did I miss anything? Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Now, these are all the qualities. Like you're that a bad teach. lawyer. <laughs> yes. Like in, in the Role Made to Soulmate book behind me, these are all the things I teach people to do um, in a in much more detailed way than that summarizes. Um, but if, the, you know, if that lawyer does that, the client he's representing or she's representing fires the, the, the lawyer and says, I would. Out of here, man. And so the lawyer. 
lawyer has lost his or her job. Uh, now let's take a less dramatic occupation than lawyer. Let's say you're a CEO, and let's say maybe a CEO for Boeing. Let's say, and you have you're being met. You're meeting with ten representatives of uh, door makers for Boeing aircraft. <laughs> and the um, which is and, much needed right now. Much needed, right now, exactly. <laughs> clearly. <laughs> and so each each door maker is presenting his or her um, you know um, you know menu for the best next door that will not you know fall off in flight and um, and the um, and so what is the Boeing CEO uh, is doing um, he or she is listening uh, to the uh, each representative present his or her um, plan for the best door but also thinking about what are the other plans that I've been presented with? How do they compare to this? What's the reputation of this person? What's the history of this person? How would that door, go, um, be, my infrastructure in Japan, how would that work out for them producing that or in China, uh, producing this portion of the door? Is that portion of the door being, uh, is, is, is that a, something so new it can't be done? So what is he doing or she doing, the, the CEO? She or he is self-listening. They're listening to themselves have responses while the other person is talking. So let's say as a result, and that's that's good for the CEO and it's good for the lawyer. But let's say that lawyer or the CEO comes home from work, female or male, um, and their their wife or their husband, their their spouse is talking, um, and um, or their children are talking, and you're listening for a few seconds, um, picking up the gist of what they're saying, and then beginning to form in your own mind's eye your response to that or your solution to that. And your children or your wife or your husband do, do not feel listened to or heard. They just can feel the energy of you self-listening or listening to yourself form a response. And so the qualities it takes to be successful at work are so frequently in tension with the qualities it takes to be successful in love. And so those are things that are... That, that no one is really working on. Um, and that's part of what the Role Mate to Soulmate book um, teaches couples to um, be conscious of and to also um, know how to not do and to overcome the natural propensity to do that. I mean, I, I even think about, Warren, like this podcast. I, admittedly, I'm self-listening in a lot of ways because that you is the to, role. I'm, your, I'm trying role, to lead right. the conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to steer this in a way that I think is going to be advantageous for the people who are listening. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, you can see me, I'm fervently taking notes, mm -hmm. but I found in my relationship with, with my girlfriend now is when I just listen, not self-listen, when I just listen to her without the need to respond or solve her problems, typically my responses might be, Oh, I'm sorry, or that sounds like it was a hard day, or that sucks, or you know, something where it's not me trying to solve anything yes. has actually been more advantageous than me rushing in to be the CEO of the relationship. And I wrote this down here earlier. Tell me what you think about this. This is something I talked about earlier in the week on one of our previous podcasts, but I said that women speak the language of connection and men speak the language of respect. So when a woman comes to a man to tell him about her day, she wants to be listened to. That's empathy, that's connection. Mm -hmm. When a man wants to tell his woman about his day, he wants to be respected for the good work and the value mm -hmm. that he provided and everything that came with what he contributed to the relationship. Well, here's the trick to that. That's so true that oftentimes, therefore, the man is talking about what he succeeded doing so he can get that respect as opposed to talking about his vulnerability, his hurt, somebody that sort of disconnected from him, um, something that happened where he failed, something that happened where he's having a problem. And so he oftentimes represses that part of his day so he can get respect as opposed to feel connection. So that's one part of the, the connection. Can I part. jump in there real quick yeah, sure. on that one? So this is an issue that I've had for, and, and anybody who's listened for a long time knows this, and I'm open to being wrong. The, the idea of vulnerability, you know, mm -hmm. and I think we have to define that term because everybody defines it a little bit differently, but I've seen and even been part of situations where a man is vulnerable, like you're saying, mm -hmm. and it actually undermines the relationship or at least the perspective that the woman has on the man is there a point at which vulnerability is 
repulsive or off-putting to women that you would need to be aware of that as a man? The answer, unfortunately, is yes. Um, and so that's one of the reasons. So it, almost everything is a dance. And men don't, men aren't vulnerable because when we're vulnerable to men, to, to women, uh, we feel we'll lose the female's respect. And usually that's the case. We're not vulnerable to other men because we're fearful that if we are, we'll lose their respect as well. So you're, 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 if you're vulnerable to a, a man and you say, gee, I'm really having a tough time with my, you know, marriage right now. I'm a little bit preoccupied. Excuse me and forgive me about that. But, you know, I haven't been really my same self. And, um, you know, I think we may be headed for a divorce. And, you know, she says this and I say this and the kids say this and here's what's happening. And it's like, oh, whoa, wait a minute. Uh, the other man is saying to himself in his mind's eye, if, you know, I, I'm very happy to be listening to you for the first 30 seconds. Um, but after that, you know, if you, continue, if you continue to go on, I'm going to be not only I'm going to be losing some respect for you, but I'm also if something comes up about, you know, should, you know, should we promote Ryan or should we promote Kevin? Uh, maybe we should promote Kevin. Ryan's not in such a good space right now. And so then Ryan is feeling a, a loss of respect for the people that he's shared this vulnerability with. So, um, and so there's, so, so, here, so here's men's takeaway. If I'm vulnerable to a woman, I lose respect. If I'm vulnerable to a man, I lose respect. To whom can I be vulnerable? No one. And men are very bottom line. And so when we realize that we can't be vulnerable to anyone, we don't oftentimes even allow ourselves to acknowledge our own vulnerability. Sometimes it comes out as anger. And almost always, anger is vulnerability's mask. You find anybody who's angry, and instead of if you're angry and you know, you're getting a divorce and you're angry during the divorce and one of you explodes, just go, instead of hearing the word, instead of hearing anger and responding with anger, whenever you hear anger, hear the word, hear vulnerability, and you'll be more tempted to respond with empathy. And so, um, so, so this is the challenge there. Now, you said something about men respect women connection. I dealt with the respect part. Let me deal with the connection part on the part of women. Um, what percentage of your audience is female? Uh, 10 to 15 percent, roughly, Richard. depending on which Rich. demographic you're looking at or which okay. platform you're looking at. Yeah, got you. Uh, whether you're a woman or a man listening to this, um, he, this is really crucial to understand. Um, when a woman is um, sharing something at work, um, what um, she does, if you listen for a bit and then you come up and you're working on s solutions, here's what is really happening for you. Um, when a woman is bleeding, if we love her, our natural protector instinct responds with, I have one obligation of who I love is bleeding. I need to find the Band-Aid that will stop the bleeding. I need to save her. And so therefore, when she is talking, our desire is to self-listen to solutions that we can provide to take away her bleeding, to take away her pain. Um, but the real solution, and so here is what is happening for the woman. When we provide the solution, after a few minutes, we interrupt her, her need to just process and complete talking about that. But we also, by providing a solution in a few seconds, we are basically saying, don't worry, honey, I can provide, I can figure out a solution in a few seconds to what you couldn't figure out in a lifetime. <laughs> now, that doesn't make her feel Demeaning. very... That's very demeaning, very condescending, very insulting. She doesn't articulate it that way, and you didn't intend it that way, but that's the way it feels to her. And so when I'm working with CEOs or top executives in particular who are much more vulnerable to getting that quick solution out, like we talked about a minute ago, um, I say there is a solution when the woman you love is complaining, listening, um, and that is to be there for her. 
listen there. Uh, Listen with a blank mind. Listen with an empathy in your eyes, an empathy in your heart, um, and share with her when when she's finished. Um, Just uh, respond to her by just giving space. Seeing, and oftentimes when you give space, she'll come up with another dimension of what else, what was bothering her because she now sees that she's being listened to. And then when she says to you something like, so what do you think? Um, the best answer is, and this is not an answer, this is where I sometimes fall down. And when my wife suggests, you know, um, do you have a thought? I usually bring up the solution that I think, but I don't do it until she asks for it. But even, <laughs> but, but when I'm at my best, even when she does ask for my thoughts or my solutions, I say, I do have some thoughts, but I'd le- what are your thoughts? What would you do? And you know, four out of five times, I'd say, she comes up with either a, a, as, as good, a better solution, or alternatively, something that I would have said anyway. But she feels a lot better when she invents it, when she comes up with it. Um, she feels better about herself. So if you want, so the solution to listening to a woman who's complaining about the challenges she's had during her day. The solution is listening, followed by listening, integrated with empathy. That's mm-hmm. all. What that's the that? solution. It's not that's solving the, the problem. It's, she, it's, like, it's like solving for X. And you don't know what X is, but in this case, X is listening and empathy. Guys want to solve the problem you are solving the problem by listening and being right. empathetic. That's what I'm hearing yeah. you say. Exactly. That is the solution. Uh, this yeah. is like, I wrote this down. This is like uh, sex or, or gender chess is how I've referred to it as. <laughs> yes. You know, it's, it's when, when you're playing chess, you're, you're making moves, you're, you're trying to trap pieces, you're trying to lure and bait them in. And I'm not saying we need to manipulate in a negative way, but I'm saying you're looking five, six, 10 moves down the road. And if you go in and solve a problem like you think you should, you just set yourself up. You're going to be checkmated before, before you know it. But if you're thinking about it ahead of time, like she doesn't need me to solve the problem the way I want to solve the problem. She needs me just to listen and be empathetic. I mean, the best phrases are, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that sucks. I would feel the same way you do right now if I was in that situation. Those phrases have been helpful for me to be empathetic when right. I just want to solve the problem. Wow. I don't know how you handle that. That's amazing. Oh, I'm so Good sorry. You know, those types of things. And then also your, you know, your eye contact and, and, and just is so important too. It's, you know, we speak not just through our words, but through our eyes as well. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. I know we kind of uh, jumped the gun a little bit because I've always enjoyed our conversations, but you've got a new book called Rollmate to Soulmate. I think it would help if you identified what those terms mean because when I saw soulmate, immediately, admittedly, I had a negative connotation with it. Like soulmate to me almost makes it feel as if, you know, there's one person that I'm divinely connected to and that's the person Mm -hmm. I just need to find out of the 8 billion people on the planet. And I don't believe that. I'm not sure you believe that. So I'd like you to define those terms for me, if you would. Sure. Um, first, when people first fall in love, they often even, you know, when they, the first time they have sex together, if there's a, if there's a chemi- chemical attraction, uh, they often like feel like they're soulmates. And of course, they're not a soulmate with somebody they don't even know uh, yet. Um, but, you know, eventually as their relationship m- moves on, they, they start playing roles. Those roles may be traditional, non-traditional, whatever they each, they, they, they each carve out what they, what they tend to do in a relationship. And what's also usually happening is that when they begin to start feeling that there's something the other person does that isn't like it, they would like to do it, they start maybe giving um, a suggestion for an improvement. Uh, the person hearing that suggestion for an improvement often considers um, it a criticism. And the biologically, I explain in Rollmate to Soulmate that the biologically natural response to being criticized is to be defensive. Now, uh, let me explain biologically natural. Historically speaking, when we heard a criticism, it was a potential enemy. So it was functional to get up our defenses so we wouldn't be killed by the enemy. Or alternatively, to kill the enemy before the enemy killed us. And so that was functional for survival. It's just dysfunctional for love. 
And yet almost everybody who gets into a relationship when they begin to feel criticized the first time or two, uh, because there's so much love there and so much heart open, uh, we're oftentimes open to a criticism or two. Uh, but as a relationship goes on, and especially if, when you start living together, and especially when, once you have children, uh, there are so many complexities to raising children and even to you know, to living together, um, particularly if one person moves into the home of another person that's a set up for um, a, a series of challenges and everyone feels criticized a great deal. And so the, uh, the response so often to the criticism is to become defensive. So the person sharing that, cons what they consider a concern, not a criticism, um, is to uh, start to walk on eggshells because, you know, the last time I brought up uh, something like this to, to Ryan or to, you know, Joe or Jane, um, you know, they, she or he responded defensively. So I'm going to be careful about just doing it at the right moment, the right time, the right way and everything else. And you sort of feel like you're sort of both walking on eggshells in a relationship um, pretty soon. If you don't have a, a, a venting um, outlet, uh, women usually begin to talk to other women, men drink, uh, or just come home later or, you know, do something along those lines or keep, keep the feelings to themselves for the reasons we mentioned before. And so, um, so what I, I saw this being tr true. So I, I, in, in my, I, for 30 years, I've been doing, um, uh, uh, couples workshops called role mate to soulmate. Um, and, um, and I, and I advised at the beginning, you know, that when you were, you're criticized to really be aware of not being defensive, everybody in the workshop agreed. Um, and then, um, but I, then I started doing follow-up phone calls to the people who attended the workshop. There were free and group phone calls. And I said, you know, what worked, what didn't work? And almost invariably, a very high percentage of people say, well, that, you know, the moment that the criticism appeared, the wisdom disappeared. <laughs> the, um, you know, I, I got the wisdom in the workshop to, not to be defensive when I was criticized. I, I, <laughs> I registered that wisdom. The criticism was far more powerful than the wisdom. Um, and bam, I, I was, you know, went right back to being um, um, defensive again. So I asked myself so something that's always intrigued me in life is um, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with things that are fairly universal problems. And then I sort of make an effort to look at whether I have a solution to a fairly universal problem. 99% of the time, I don't. So, or somebody else has a much better one or um, faster or whatever. Um, so, um, but in this case, I felt I could develop a solution. But I had a really tough job on my hands, which is if responding to criticism defensively is biologically natural, I'm going to have to teach somebody how to make an evolutionary shift when they hear criticism. And so I, long story short, I, and I, I experimented with what worked and didn't work in the, um, and got feedback from the, um, the follow-up phone calls. I saw that, what, um, uh, that I needed to set aside a time during the week that I ended up calling a caring and sharing practice or a caring and sharing time that lasted about two hours in which before a person, uh, before a person heard only one criticism or concern of their partner, they did a number of things. First, they learned to appreciate their partner at five levels of specificity. Then it would be followed by altering their natural biological state so that um, they altered their natural defensiveness by sharing six mindsets that I'll elaborate on in a moment. Um, and they read them, they say those mindsets out loud. So the person about to share a concern or criticism sees that they're preparing themselves to be safe and experience the criticism not as a as something to be defensive, but rather as an opportunity to be more deeply loved. So I'll take a little sip of tea here and explain the, the appreciations more, and then also how I do the um, the, the mindset, so um, which I think are, are really fun. While you're taking that sip, um, one thing that I wrote down here, and this is something I've, I've learned and often said is um, 
well, number one, not all who criticize you are your enemies and not all who praise you are your allies. That's important to know. But the, the thing that's been really helpful t- to me in these situations that seem to be tense, and I think men know when it's getting tense. You're having a conversation with your spouse and significant other. You're feeling away. She's communicating verbally and non-verbally that she's getting tense and upset is to ask myself, what is it that I want out of this? Mm-hmm. And no man wants to be combative with his wife. Mm-hmm. What he wants is, to your point earlier, to be respected, to be appreciated, to build a deeper connection, to move the family forward, to raise kids together, to have a beautiful life, however that looks like to them. I, I found that by just taking a pause and a step back and asking myself, what is my goal in this conversation keeps me from sticking my dumb foot in my dumb mouth, with that, which yes. I happen to do quite often. Yes. Yes. Well, yes, that's absolutely wonderful. And most everybody would agree with that. The challenge is that for most people too often, as you were just implying, um, at the moment of the criticism, the criticism stings so much. And ironically, the more, well, not ironically, but sort of understandably, the more deeply you love somebody, the more it stings, the more it hurts. Mm. Uh, Yeah, because it counts. You care about it more. The the depth of love makes you vulnerable. And so the, um, and, and so the first thing that I have couples do is to, before they share their one, one concern, and they're only allowed to share one concern per week and explain what to do the rest of the week in terms of creating a conflict-free zone. Uh, but um, they, before they share that one concern, I have them share two appreciations at five levels of specificity. Um, so let's say you say to, to your, um, it's, let's say it's just past Thanksgiving, and you um, say, you know, I just want you to know I really... Um, love the turkey the way the way you cook, um, so that would be um, a, an appreciation. But that's at one level of specificity, and you know she's probably got heard that a dozen times before. But level of specificity number two is I really love the way the the, your, the skin on that turkey um, came out so crisp. And how did you manage to do that? You seem to do that every time. So now you're becoming more specific. And with that specificity, you're expressing curiosity, which is showing respect. How did you manage to do that? Uh, you seem to do it every time. And then, uh, and then also, I notice that the dressing is so nice and moist. I love moist dressing rather than this dry dressing. How do you manage to both get the dressing moist and the skin crisp at the same time? You'd think that the cr- crispness of the skin might make the dressing dry out. Um, and then the spices are so great. And so rather than just saying spicing is great, you, say, you try to identify, even if you don't get it right, what those spices are so that, that the person feels seen. Uh, so is that, was that parsley or sage or rosemary or thyme or some other Simon and Garfunkel spice? <laughs> they, um, <laughs> and, you, um, and, so, um, and so now uh, the person being appreciated is feeling not just appreciated in general, but at such a specific level and with curiosity that shows respect for um, how, they, how they have um, done something so well. So Can I and, jump in on that one sure, real quick? Yep, absolutely. Does that, how do you keep that from being disingenuous? Because I, I, I can agree with you on the specificity. You say it easier than I can say it. You know, for example, I might compliment my girlfriend and say she looks good, but the other day she was wearing a pair of shorts that were just the right length with frills and her legs looked phenomenal. And that's what I said. I'm like, those shorts look amazing and your legs look incredible. Mm -hmm. So that specificity, I think, makes it more meaningful because it's not just a generic, I'm supposed to say you look good. I I actually mean it. But how do you keep it from coming across as disingenuous? Because, for example, the turkey scenario, if I ever asked that to somebody, they'd be like, that doesn't even sound like you. And it doesn't, it sounds like you're gaming or manipulating, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, I mean, a lot depends on your tone of voice. And, and also, the, when, you, when you first begin to do any new behavior, there's going to be, a, there's going to be an artificiality to it. Um, and, but as you practice a behavior, it becomes much more natural. Um, to, to you. So for, for me, I practice that behavior a lot. 
and it you know no longer comes across as sort of weird because it's it's a part of me now and mm. so all all of these things so one of the things that, that is true in the role mate to soulmate book and also the workshop and the online course that goes with it is that every th- that since handling personal criticism without becoming defensive is uh, is biologically unnatural that every single thing that i teach is unnatural at the beginning mm. and Good it's point. not only and it's uh, so it will maybe at first seem like it, it's you're working at it and the reason it seems like you're working at it is because you are working at it. Um, it's the, I used to call the subtitle of Rollmate to Soulmate um, in the workshop form, I still do, The Art and Discipline of Love. And people got the discipline of love. And the answer is yes, if, if, if you are naturally defensive in response to criticism, becoming not defensive requires both a method and a process that I teach, but it also requires a discipline to do something that's unnatural repeatedly just because it works. And so, you know... You get better at the things you practice, essentially. Yes, exactly. And when you practice them, the wonderful thing is that your neurons can start connecting differently and 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 something that you practice again and again becomes natural after a while. Well, so, I mean, I imagine you're also going to get feedback when you're specific. She's going to respond more favorably, which reinforces the idea that maybe you're on the right path here. Yeah, and there are very, very few people who have something seen about them uh, that is very specific um, that they um, you know, that they don't like. Like, you know, um, your beard is really nice and trim. Uh, the last time I, I um, um, did a podcast with you two years ago, if I'm remembering your beard, long beard long and bushy. was much, yeah. much longer. And um, and it looked good both ways, but actually I like it even better now that it's trim. You know, so, um, and, you know, uh, and you have a much more informal uh, feel to you, but the, but there is a, a power to the type of blue shirt that you're wearing um, now that, that comes across very well. And it, and it distinguishes, distinguishes, distinguishes itself from the background and the background blends in really nicely with your hair. And so it really creates a nice overall combination. Now that's boom, boom, boom. And it's, you know, but that's specific. And so you're, I'm not just saying to you, oh, you're looking good today. You know, right. and so, um, and, and the, I can the, tell you the way you're saying, even that, even just in that, I'm like, that feels good to hear those mm-hmm. things. So mm-hmm. naturally we're going to respond favorably. Yes. To them. And so, be, so it's so helpful. So this caring and sharing practice, I have couples do once a week. I have every couple put, um, a couple of weeks ahead of time on the calendar, uh, when their caring and sharing practice will be. It's usually on Sunday for most people because it's a bit more of a relaxed day. Make, if you have children, making sure that you let the children know this is time that mom and dad are going to be spending talking with each other about trying to solve problems and work with each other and appreciate each other. And eventually you teach the children how to do this process also. Um, but um, this is this is mom and dad time and you make sure that you have a situation set up so that you have that privacy during that time. And so... Um, you then um, share two appreciations, and then you, because, because it's biologically natural to be defensive, you have to do something that's biologically unnatural to experience criticism from someone you love as something that you associate with an opportunity to be more deeply loved rather than criticize and angry and defensive. So, so I ask people to, to alter their natural state um, by sharing out loud six mindsets that each bring them into a deeper and deeper way of being able to hear criticism without becoming defensive. So, for example, the first mindset might be what I call the love guarantee. And the love guarantee is saying something like the following. If I provide a safe environment for what you want to say, even if I 100% disagree with it, even if you're exaggerating, in my opinion, even if you're shouting at me or sarcastic, if I just provide a safe environment for that, no matter what the tone of voice, etc., you'll feel more secure with me, 
less like you have to walk on eggshells, more, lo- more like you feel um, that I love you, um, uh, you'll feel more loved by me, and therefore you'll feel more love for me. So now I'm having the person about to hear this say this out loud. So the person about to give the criticism knows that every time she or he says something that could be argued with, that they're not seeing their partner um, start to form self-listen or form a response to that. They're seeing their partner become more and more, in a way, pleased that they're exaggerating, lying, or shouting because um, they, um, because they, uh, they f- they're feeling more secure. Um, and so then, ironically, therefore, there's no need to shout, no need to lie, no need to exaggerate because you know you're going to be heard. Right. Lying, be shouting, heard exaggerating way. are usually things that are ways of, or, or nagging, are usually statements about we don't have not felt heard, and so therefore we have to exaggerate, we have to lie, uh, we have to repeat, we have to nag in order to get heard. Mm. Um, and that's so, interesting. I think about that. You know, the the common example would be, you know, a wife asking her husband to, you know, work on the the garden boxes, and she has to ask him, you know, every week for, you know, sixteen weeks before he finally does it. Yes. She's not nagging so much, if I'm understanding you correctly, because she needs the garden boxes, although she might. She's nagging because she doesn't feel heard, is what you're saying. Heard about, about that issue, yes. And Like it's know, not important to the husband, but it's important to her, but she's not feeling like she's, her priorities are the husband's priorities. Yes, yes, or that he's mm. not at least adapting somewhat or responding you know, that um, I don't do the garden box, you know, eventually responding when he has his turn to talk. So the most important thing is when that person's talking about, you know, doing the garden boxes, oftentimes they're feeling that the energy that's coming from the person listening to them is, you know, why I can't do it or how much she's nagging or, you know, um, it's it's a sort of defensive, non-receptive response as opposed to just like, um, really feeling that, okay, so what I hear you saying is that the garden boxes, you'd like the garden boxes done because, you know, when you look out of the garden boxes, you really see a type of beauty and it gives you a type of peace. And you've tried to do this yourself, but, you know, um, uh, but Ryan, you know, I know you do this better and more naturally than I do. And so I really would love it if you could, if you could do that. And so your first job is just to hear this and just to see that, and let her know that you're hearing um, that, that, that you're hearing this. You, you let her know what you've heard her say. And then you say, did, did I distort anything? And she says, well, yeah, I, just, I think you distorted this. And so then you don't argue with the distortion. You um, keep working at it until she says, no, nothing was distorted. And then you ask if anything is missed. And, um, and then uh, she says something that you did miss something. You don't say, no, I think I included that. You just you work at it until she feels uh, that there's nothing um, missed, and then uh, if you then you invite her to add something new if she wishes to add something that maybe she felt like she forgot or didn't feel safe to add at the beginning. Now I say she, but you know this 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 issue is exactly the same in same sex couples as it is with um, uh, with um, uh, heterosexual couples. Um, nobody in straight gay relation or gay relationships um no parent no child it's the same with parents parents and children uh the children don't feel heard the parents don't feel heard so this this method works when i say somebody's a couple i mean any two people who have a relationship where there's love uh, that feel that they oftentimes don't uh, feel heard by the other person um and would like to hear them more i imagine generally this is goes over initially better with a, a, a woman than a man just no. because of the nature of a woman wanting to work. Is that wrong? Yes, that's correct. That's, that is. For different reasons, men and women, um, women are more likely to say what um, they want in a relationship and not feel heard. Men are more likely to repress it because the few times they have said something, 
um, she's disconnected from him sexually. She's disconnected with him emotion from him emotionally, and he promises himself that he will not um, complain. He just keeps it to himself. So his response, the deeper, long-term, destructive response, is sometimes he either goes out drinking or stays, you know, um, uh, uh, goes golfing or d does something that gets him away from the tension. Um, or alternatively, um, he keeps it to himself, keeps it to himself, and you know, some, something comes up that's relatively small, and bam, it comes out as a volcano um, of anger. And um, I so only ask because I, I imagine. You know, when like if a woman were to bring this to the table of this, you know, this concentrated time to be able to discuss these, generally, I think a man would more easily say or feel that this is a silly exercise. But since we're talking to men and every single person listening to this podcast wants to improve their relationship, they would not be listening if that weren't the case. Are there situations in which women feel threatened or feel it silly or shut down and are not receptive to these changes that a man might try to implement in his relationship. Yes. First of all, you want to be a woman's hero? You suggest, let's read Role Mate to Soul Mate and then watch the online course and do, and do this process together. Now, this is going to end up benefiting you as much as it will her. But she'll be so. Most women will be so shocked <laughs> that you, as a man, yeah, are suggesting this, this, yes, this, this, and your, your, your point, so to speak, your res the respect for you, the will go up just for making the suggestion, um, and the and what it ends up doing is it, it definitely. Um, it benefits both people in the relationship to feel that they aren't walking on eggshells. And that is, um, and men and women do that in different ways for different reasons. Men and men in, in gay relationships, um, it's, there's, I have never experienced a gay couple that doesn't have the same problems, basically, of not feeling heard and, and so on. I'll show you, share one other uh, mindset with you, which is kind of fun, uh, that, that, that I have people, um, alter their from their natural biological selves. Um, I have every couple uh, sit um, back to back um, and uh, write in a piece of paper um, the answer to the following question. Um, make believe your partner is, is, your loved one is about to be killed in either maybe let's say drowning or in a, a car accident. And you know with 100% certainty that you can save her or his life um, but you know, you sense in that tenth of a second that you have about a 50% chance of losing your own life in the process. Would you, and then they have three options, would you do it yes, no, uncertain? Now that is, just to repeat that, you're, you, you have 100%, your, your partner is going to have a 100% chance of dying unless you interfere, but if you interfere, you'll have a 100% chance of saving their life but you'll have a 50% chance of losing your own life. Would you do it? Yes, no, uncertain. Then have everybody wrinkle up their piece of paper into a tight ball and, and then the men read out uh, the other men's and the women's read out the women's. Uh, they never see each other's um, answer. About 90% of the men say that they would be willing to risk their lives at the 50% level uh, for a 100% really? chance yes, of saving their I partner. Thought, I would think it'd be 100%. No, not 100%. Remember, about a quarter of the people in the workshop are considering divorcing. Some of them have even filed Fair. for divorce. So, I was um, going to say, I would say 100, if I had to guess, 100% men and somewhere around 60 to 75% for women. That would be my guess. Right, right. It's, it's 90, oh, but uh, the one thing I ask is, I say is that children, make-believe children are not a factor. Okay. Um, so, okay. So it's a, it turns out usually that it's about 90% of the men and about 80% of the women. Uh, a little bit more, sometimes more, sometimes less than in both cases. So it's enough that, uh, so then uh, the, fir the, second, the first mindset that I have them do is to um, say, well, if I'm willing to risk my life dying for you, I guess the least I can do is listen to you. Hmm. And it's like it puts listening to your partner, even if you wouldn't be willing to die, but maybe just lose an arm or a leg, or you'd have to give up your home or, you know, give up the, your favorite car. Um, you could, you know, do it at that level. But if 
if I'm willing to, you know, give you my car rather than have you be killed, um, would you be willing, you know, it's a lot easier to give you my, um, um, to, uh, if I'm willing to give you my car, the least I can do is listen to you. So, I mean, it um, depends on what kind of car we're talking about here, though, to be honest, right? <laughs> <laughs> If it's that's, a, it, that, that's an interesting, it's a little bit of a setup, but it also is a way to frame that listening is not really that big of a sacrifice in, in the grand scheme of things. Exactly. And, and, and more powerfully, when you see how much it means to each person to feel seen and heard. And when you begin to, there's a chapter in the book on how to create family dinner nights without creating family dinner nightmares. Once you master this with your partner, then I teach you how to master this, teach your children how to do this as well. When, you, when your children know how to do this for their brother and their sister and for you, um, they, um, they've, you've given them probably the greatest gift you could give a child, um, aside from your overall love and attention. Um, and that is the ability to not only have the skills to hear everybody else effectively, but also um, to, uh, to to empathize with everybody else. I teach um, in that chapter on how to do a family dinner night without doing a family dinner nightmare. I teach parents how not just to empathize with children, but also to require the children to empathize with the parents and their perspectives. Mm. And, um, and the, because oftentimes parents that are very empathetic but don't require the children to also be empathetic do not create empathetic children. They create self-centered children that are always used to being empathized with and uh -huh. never required to do empathy for. Um, and so, yeah, they're always the beneficiary of, not the not the, the gifter or whatever term you want to use. Yes, yeah. and I heard this initially from teachers that were shocked that on parent-teacher night, some of the really empathetic kids in the class had, teach, uh, had parents that were required a lot of them, including to be heard by them. Um, and, the, and conversely, that children that were you know, very self-centered often had very empathetic parents that the teacher loved on, on, on teacher-parent night. Um, but it was, and then begin to piece that together, that, that, you know, that one-way empathy does not beget empathy. One-way empathy begets self-centeredness. So interesting. Well, Dr. Farrow, we've talked about a lot. <laughs> we've yeah, covered indeed. so much, and we might need to do a round two. Admittedly, I haven't read the book yet. It's on its way here, so I'm very excited to dig in. I know enough about it to be dangerous and ask some decent questions, but I'm actually really, really excited to dig into this for my own personal uh, romantic relationship and also for the relationship I have with my kids. And you also make the point, and I saw this, that this doesn't just apply to romantic relationships, but platonic relationships, professional relationships. So yes. I'm very excited to dig into this book. Very good. If we do a second show, yeah, let's, do, let's take that both deeper on what we were talking about. The, that caring and sharing time was only one of 23, uh, what I call love enhancements, all of which are unnatural, but all of which really work. One of them is called the conflict-free zone. But then another is that once I teach people, couples to do this with each other, I teach them how to do this with um, family members that they love, but have political disagreements with. Um, so mm. to, to turn civil war into civil dialogue and um, a whole series of things like that. So I'd be very happy to, to dig into those things with you again. You also talk about, um, I took some notes earlier today. Let me see if I can find this here. I think you call them love. Is, oh, it's uh, the four depleters of love, which is criticisms. We talked a little bit about that. Right. Complaining, complacency, and controlling. So yes. I'm excited to get into that too. Absolutely. Well, why don't you tell guys where to connect with you and obviously to pick up a copy of the book so they know where to go. You know, fortunately, the Roll Made to Soul Made is um, have on 30% discount right now on Amazon, so that's the easy way to do it. However, I'm going to do something that you probably never heard an author say before. Uh, the book itself is not as important as also doing with the book um, an online, the online couples course, and that's so important. I've made it practically free. When you get the book, you'll have a QR code, go to the course, do that course with the person you love. The course, the online course, will take you through all the practices. This, 
this book is about practices um, that you and your partner will do that will really deepen your love. Um, and so reading it is very useful. And it's, it's broader and deeper than I can go in the online um, couples course. But um, as I was saying before, um, when criticism appears, wisdom disappears. And when you only read something, when you don't practice it, um, it'll disappear a lot more quickly. You really have to retrain your mind to do things that are biologically unnatural, but but uh, emotionally extremely functional. Um, you know, we we weren't we weren't trained to hear our enemy, and lawyers weren't trained to listen carefully to the um, uh, to the opposing attorney. So it really does require practice. You know, what's interesting about this is I was listening to a clip from Jordan Peterson, who I know is a friend of yours, and I think you've been on his podcast uh, at least once that I know of. Three times. And yeah. Three times, is that right? Is that what you said, three yeah. times? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he had said something in this clip that I heard just a day or two ago, and it coincides almost perfectly with what you're saying. He said that it's very important that couples carve out at least 90 minutes a week for specific discussion around relationships. And you're saying two hours correlates yeah. very closely to sort of have two well-versed, well-researched men that I highly respect talking about the same thing gives it mm -hmm. even more weight. And mm -hmm. I would also suggest too, if you're listening to this podcast and you feel intimidated about bringing this book to the table or the online course that you offer in addition to the book, just have your partner listen to this podcast because that might be enough for them to say, okay, maybe I am interested in doing the book and maybe I am interested in doing the course if that's what you feel will help get that across the finish line for them. Um, Dr. Farrell, appreciate you, appreciate your work. Thank you as always for joining the podcast. I appreciate it. It is, you, you listen so well, you ask great questions, You're, um, you, you, you put yourself on the line and um, open yourself up with, with um, thoughts. It really is a pleasure. Um, uh, talking with you and being doing this podcast together. Thank you. That means a lot. 